The following program may contain coarse language. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon. Hello, I'm Julie Nisrella. Welcome to CBC Music's showcase for the beautiful Aeolian Hall. I would like to begin by acknowledging the treaty territory of the Anishinaabek, which is defined within the pre-Confederation treaty known as the London Township Treaty of 1796. Throughout this time, the region has also become the current home to the Haudenosaunee and the Lene Lenope nations. Now, Aeolian Hall was built in the 1880s and has gone through some pretty interesting transformations. Before becoming a concert hall, it was a fire station, it was a public school, and the first branch of the London Public Library. And today, Aeolian Hall is hailed as being one of the top three performing venues in Canada. So welcome to beautiful Aeolian Hall. In this special space, over the next two hours, you'll hear music from all four classical Juno categories, starting with the Griffin Trio and this third movement from Rebecca Clark's Piano Trio, right now. <laughs>
Pretty amazing, huh? The piece is not only fierce, but it's excellent to watch you guys play because you are so passionate when you play. You just heard Annalie Patapatanakun on the violin, Jamie Parker on the piano, this guy, Roman Boris, who make up the Juno Award-winning Griffin Trio with the third movement from Rebecca Clark's Piano Trio. This is CBC Music's Juno Classical Showcase. I'm Julie Nasralla, Roman Boris, how are you? Hey, Jules. Hi. It's great to be here. <laughs> How are you? I'm doing good. Well, we've got an amazing program here. It's a pretty hot lineup we've got here backstage. And everyone's in the back getting along and eating fruit. <laughs> so thank you so much for being here, and thank you for being the JunoFest Classical Showcase house band. So you three aren't your typical classical trio. You guys aren't afraid of anything anything you play you've commissioned more than 85 pieces so the trio has undergone quite an evolution over the years why is this important to you uh, commissioning I'm presuming is what we're talking about. Commissioning, I mean, just keeping the art form alive has been a huge thing for us. I mean, we're, we're actually just celebrating the end of our 25th anniversary. And actually, you know, speaking of keeping things interesting and alive, commissioning, working with composers who, you know, for the most part have become great friends and colleagues and sort of lifelong uh, partners in our, in our journey, as it were. Um, I mean, it's just been an incredible story. And actually, we've collaborated with all sorts of singers. The place is full of singers, including yourself. 
I know it's dangerous, actually, that there are too many singers in one room together. Um, but it also is that transition. If you look at your early albums, it's Schubert, it's Mendelssohn. But you guys really, you've brought up the edge. You're doing so much other stuff. You're bringing in other genres. Well, and we're very interested uh, in that activity, both for our own artistic growth and to satisfy our, our own curiosity, but also because we are so interested uh, in what it is um, that the audience is perceiving and what we do and what and we want to ensure we're very interested in engaging with the audience and creating impact and making sure that the work that we do is both satisfying to us but also of interest um, for audiences of, of all demographics and ages. I mean, that's, that's a mission for us these days. Connection. Connection, Connection yes. Yes. <laughs> so what's next? Well, uh, ooh, what's next? Uh, we're, we're, we're busy uh, programming and actually just in the process of, uh, of announcing our Chamber Fest to the Ottawa Chamber Fest season just in the coming days. Um, and uh, was announced not too long ago that, that we're now, we have a new directorship role at the Banff Center where the new, we will be starting in 2020, uh, the directors of the summer music programming there. In addition to doing the things in Ottawa and playing my cello and working with these guys and keeping things going for another 25 years, no doubt. That's amazing. Well, thanks again for being here. We're now going to bring out Miriam Khalil, who's going to join the party. Right. Looking gorgeous and resplendent. Marhaba Habibti. Miriam Khalil is here to sing selections from Osvaldo Golikov's Air. Come on, you 
That's what you call a wow moment. <laughs> you just heard Miriam Khalil with selections from Osvaldo Golikov's air with the Griffin Trio. This is CBC Music's Juno Classical Showcase. I'm Julie Nazralla. We are at Aeolian Hall in London, Ontario. And right now, Ms. Miriam Khalil is next to me in her gorgeous gown with her gorgeous voice. <laughs> So, Miriam, you said this piece feels like home to you. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, when I first heard this piece, um, two of the pieces that are in it are Arabic from Byzantium Mass that I celebrated my entire life. We moved to Canada when I was seven and joined uh, a Melkite church, and so going from Damascus sing singing the same Mass to here, um, and two of the pieces are excerpted in this song cycle. Um, and then on top of it, it's my Arabic roots and my Christian Arabic roots, but then added to the classical part of myself, which I've been working on for years and years and years. So it's like this perfect marriage of repertoire in one 45-minute cycle. It's kind of like it was written for you. It feels like that sometimes, because I can be everything that I am in this one piece, and I don't have to be just one thing, which is amazing. Pretty special. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you are Syrian-Lebanese. I'm Lebanese. I grew up in Damascus, Syria. Okay. Yep. And so my parents are from Meshgara, Lebanon, <gasps> and a small village. Um, and uh, we, they moved to Syria, and I was born there. So how do you feel when you're singing something like that that is so a part of you? It, it's like a twin piece. It's like a soul sister type of piece. I don't have to think. It's like in the, completely in the moment. I can make the sounds that come most naturally to me right away. I don't have to think, how does this sound? I just know right away within what's happening in my body and what's, how I'm reacting to the musicians, amazing musicians around me. So yeah, it's, I don't have to think. That, that's what that's home is thing. as yeah, a musician. Exactly. Freedom. And I looked over at you, and you just look in rapture, <laughs> which is a beautiful thing to be able to transport other people. Okay, Miriam, stay right here because I find it very interesting that you are a Lebanese singer from Ottawa. I am a Lebanese classical singer from Ottawa. And you know what? There's yet another classical Lebanese singer from Ottawa <laughs> in the house. I know you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> 
Joyce El Huri is also here today. Sadly, not to sing, but she's here. Wait, please welcome Joyce El Huri to the stage. Come on out, Joyce. I just have to say, this is a very Instagrammable moment right now, people. <laughs> Hello. Okay. So Joyce, I know, I know. Joyce, you spent New Year's Eve where? Come in here. I, I don't want to step no, in front no. of uh, I spent New Year's Eve at the Sydney Opera House in the Sydney Harbor. Those huge fireworks, it was incredible. I'll never forget it. What a drag. I know. <laughs> Terrible, yeah. right? Terrible life. I was on the couch eating chips. <laughs> That's fun, too. <laughs> so, w what were you doing there? I was singing uh, Mimi in La Boheme, and uh, it was opening night, New Year's Eve, big gala night. Unbelievable. Opening night of La Boheme, Sydney Opera House. Yeah. <laughs> how, how did it feel to be at Sydney Opera. Was that your first time? It was my first time. Oh my yep. gosh, so how did it feel? Well, it was a dream come true, honestly, to sing at the Sydney Opera House, this epic uh, theater. Iconic. Exactly, exactly. And uh, opening night, they really go all out. I mean, they know how to have fun. Um, Explain. Well, fireworks, music, people just wanting to celebrate life and music. Uh, it was just so inspiring. I will never forget it. How was the jet lag? Because, you know, singers with their voices and the jet lag, it's all can be very precious at times. Mm -hmm. And that is one heck of a jet lag to have. Well, I'm a kind of a professional sleeper. Uh, <laughs> so I slept the whole plane ride. Um, and I woke up and I had rehearsal an hour after I landed. And I was just, ding, I was, I was ready You were to okay? Go. Yeah. That doesn't happen every time though. I mean, yes. you know. Only it's when you just, go to Australia. Only, to sing only for when Sydney. I go to Australia. Only on that was lucky. <laughs> so you're also a big Bee Gees fan. I am. Did, did you, which I think is hilarious, but I, I am too also. Um, did you have chance to wander down to Bee Gees Way while you're there? No, I didn't even know that was a thing. There's a Bee Gees Way in Sydney, Australia. No, I'm I miss, sorry. I missed out. You know, when you, when you travel for work, so, so often you don't visit the place that you're working because you're going to rehearsal and coming back. Next time, next time. Next time. Next time you sing at Sydney, and I'm sure they're going to have you back. Well, we will see. Okay. I would love to go back. Okay, my Lebanese trifecta of divas. Oh, gosh. Um, I want to thank you both for being here, both of you, Miriam Khalil and Joyce El Khoury. One more time, this is CBC Music's Juno Classical Showcase. I'm Julie Nasrallah. <laughs> So before you both go, do you want to help me out with a little quiz for our audience? Sure. sure okay, I know, they're so, you're so on the hook now. Um, we're going to get the quiz questions. Diva, yes, hold this for me. Thank you. So just to have a little fun, we thought we might test your Juno trivia knowledge, and some CBC Music knowledge. Uh, don't worry, you won't, you won't go to CBC Music jail if you don't know the answers, it's all good. So I'll start us off. Who won the 2018 Juno Award for Classical Album of the Year, Large Ensemble Soloist or Large Ensemble Accompaniment? It's multiple choice, so was it Angela Hewitt, Jan Lezetsky, Steve Wood and the Northern Cree Singers, or James Ennis? Shout it out, don't be afraid. No, it wasn't James Ennis. Again, Angela Hewitt, Jan Lejetsky, Steve Wood, and the Northern Cree singers. 
Yama Jetski. Ding, 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 ding. Congratulations. <laughs> Miriam, would you like to try the second yeah, one? Yeah, I'll do the next one. Who won the 2018 Juno Award for Classical Composition of the Year? Jordan Nobles, Jocelyn Morlock, Christos Hatzi, R. Marie Schaefer. Ding, 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 yes. ding, ding, ding. Yay. <laughs> We do have prize packs, so if you do get the right answer, raise your hand and uh, the stage manager will be giving you a little prize pack, so don't be afraid to raise your hand because you don't want to miss out on your prize, your CBC swag, it's very important. <laughs> Joyce, would you like to help me with the third question? Yes, okay. Who won the 2018 Juno Award for Classical Album of the Year in the vocal or choral category? Gerald Finley and Julia Strake, Schubert Winterreise, L'Harmonie des Saisons, La Ciudad de Oro, Barbara Hannigan with Ludwig Orchestra, Crazy Girl Crazy, or <laughs> Karina Gauvin, Prima Donna. Who yelled Barbara Hannigan? Get that lady a swag bag. <laughs> You're right. Question number four. Who won the 2018 Juno Award for Classical Album of the Year in a solo or chamber ensemble? James Ennis, James Ennis, nominated twice in the same category, the guy's a monster, in the best way possible. Jean-Marie Zaitouni and Les Violons du Roi, or Yanina Fialkowska? Is it because I said it, Yanina Fialkowska? Did that give it away? <laughs> You're right, it's Yanina Fialkowska. Ding, ding, another prize pack over there. This one? Miriam, take it away. Because he is also Lebanese and from Ottawa, Paul Anka, also pronounced Anka. Anka. Uh, wrote the theme for whose version of The Tonight Show? Jay Leno, Conan O'Brien, Johnny Carson, Jack Parr. Johnny Carson. Okay, Johnny Carson. Lots that was a good guys. one. That was a bit of a giveaway. But actually, I didn't know that. Oh, I didn't know that either. Johnny Carson. So who won that one? Put your hand up. Get your, okay, gentlemen in the front row. Here's Johnny. Here's your CBC prize pack. Okay, guys, here's a total giveaway one. Who hosts CBC Music's National Daily Classical Show? And a prize <laughs> and a new car. <laughs> Joyce, honey, remember someone? Name the CBC music host and show that is on the air between 1 and 3.30 each day. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Shift. Oh. Tempo ends at 1. P.S. <laughs> Who's got that prize one? Here. Here? Shift. <laughs> you got it. Every day, thank you for being there. Thank you. What's your name? Athena. Thank you, Athena. It's my pleasure. <laughs> my boss is in the audience, so like, that's really good what you're doing right now. Just keep thanking me. Thank you. Aw. Name the host of CBC Music's In Concert, heard every Sunday at 11 a.m., 11.30 Newfoundland. One person, go. Yes, I can't see who said that. So many gift bags for everyone. I... People in the front here. People in the front? Yes, with the red oh, scarf. Oh, yes, red scarf. Yes. <laughs> Name the show Catherine Duncan hosts every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. You guys are so good. I know. <laughs> Like, there really aren't diehard fans like CBC diehard fans. You guys know everything. Joyce, would you like to do another one with me? Sure. Number 10. Mm -hmm. Name the two programs Canadian tenor and on air personality Ben Hepner hosts each week on CBC Music. I heard two. Did you hear the two? There's I heard two. The two. Yeah? 
Put your hand up if you yelled it. Voila, Saturday voilà. afternoon at the opera and backstage. Excellent. What time will the highlights from this Juno Classical Showcase air? <laughs> okay, Yakiner, I kind of love you, but man, that was Mr. 9 a.m. He needs a bag. What is the name of the CBC Music program that invites a classical musician in, in each week to share music that has most influenced them in their career? And hint, hint, Joyce was one of the artists on this show. Shift. Not shift. What is, this is my music, you got it. Oh, my music, okay, right here, lady, I see you. Gift bag, thank you. Vocalist, you can ask this vocal question. Number 13? Yes. Uh, name four of the five artists nominated for a 2019 Juno Award in the Classical Album of the Year Vocal or Choral category. Barbara Hannigan with Reinbert Delu. Did I say it right? I don't know. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Chœur de l'Orchestre uh, Symphonique de Montréal with Orchestra um, Symphony uh, de Montréal. Yes. I don't know. Yes. Elmer mm -hmm. Okay. Eisler. Uh, with Elmer Eisler, singer, um, and uh, Patricia O'Callaghan, who's going to be singing later. And Joyce Al Khoury and Miriam Khalid. Thank you. Welcome. Honey, I think you just gave away the answer. <laughs> No, there's no That's answer. okay. Oh, well, I was supposed to. <laughs> That's okay. We didn't prep you correctly. This was not. Blame at us. That's why I don't host the show. <laughs> okay, we're going to do one okay. more. Sorry, sorry, guys. No, no, it's fine. Yeah, really it's all did. good. You didn't ruin a thing. You couldn't possibly ruin anything, actually. So here's the last question. Which Canadian classical artist holds the record for having won the most Juno Awards? Yes. Who said that? Get that lady a swag bag. Woo. And that actually completes the CBC quiz portion of your program today. Thank you very much. Thank you, girls.
Wow. Sometimes I like to watch the audience while people are playing, and you had everyone in the palm of your hand, bobbing their heads, smiling. <laughs> the oboe is such a sweet, melancholy, and sublime sound that it, it's amazing that it can, can be sweet and profound at the same time. Serenade us all again, Sarah, would you? Oh, that was amazing. No, thanks. You no, just heard no, Sarah no. Jeffrey. <laughs> no. <laughs> Did you say okay. no thanks? <laughs> She's done, that, that's the only piece she knows. Uh, <laughs> Sarah Jeffrey on the oboe together with violinist Annalie Patapatanakun, cellist Roman Boris, and Roman Boris, and Christian Rona on the viola with Mozart's oboe quartet. So Sarah plays principal oboe with the Toronto Symphony Orchestra. No pressure, no pressure. <laughs> Delighted to have you here. Thank you, Delighted so, to be here. I often feel like if you're an oboist and you're dating someone, that your read might get more attention than the partner. A little bit, yeah. Little bit. Yeah, so, just, yeah. oboe yeah, little players, bit. you gotta watch out, you might be competing with a read. Yeah. Oboe players are known for making their own reads. You make your own as well. Yes, I do. And I remember walking past a read-making room in a music school and marveling at how these oboe players, they're in there, with their heads buried, you could be standing there for 20 minutes, they won't notice you're there, no. their heads buried, yeah. furiously carving away. Why? <laughs> what does that do? Well, your read is really your voice. So, um, different than clarinetists or um, saxophone players, the double read players, it's the, it's the, we don't have a mouthpiece, it is the mouthpiece. So, everyone has a different um, size inside of your mouth, everyone has different shaped lips, and everyone's gonna make um, them suit themselves a little bit. And so if you play on somebody else's reeds, it's, it's sort of like, um, I don't know, putting on a persona that's not really you. It doesn't, it doesn't feel good and you can't shine. So um, when you make your own, you can really put that special touch on it. But um, to date somebody while you are making reeds, it's important to become efficient at reed making so that you can actually have a life. <laughs> Right? So that's really what you study when you go to school, is how to become better so you don't end up one of those people you were talking about. You, yeah. So that's my whole goal in life. It's different if you're being stood up by another person, but to actually be stood up by a reed is a whole other oh, kettle. It's whole other show, actually, really. Devastating. Um, so do you use different reeds for different people? pieces, like if you're playing Mozart, are you using your sweet Mozart read, or if you're playing something contemporary, are you using your, your fierce modern day read? Yeah, no, that's it's such a mystery. That's exactly the oh. idea. So you make your reads um, based on the um, quality of articulation you're going to be using, based on the color of sound you're looking for, um, even the difference between a piece like this in F major versus a piece um, in a uh, Brahms symphony in C minor would okay. be a very, very different read, and so you'd put a different spin on it. Well, thank you so much <laughs> for illuminating the mystery of the read for me and all of us. Okay. Thank you so much for being here, Sarah. Thank you, Julie. Thank it you. was a bye pleasure bye. to meet you. Yeah, bye, bye.
I think we are all looking at the flute in a whole other different way right now. Intense. You just heard Skinscape, music by Becca Sims, performed by Amanda Lowry on the flute. You're both here with me. Thank you for being here. Wow. Happy St. <laughs> Patrick's Day for tomorrow. <laughs> Fantastic. I wish I could do that to my hair. How are you? I'm better now that you've made the connection. Thank Thanks. you. I'm smart that way. So, Becca, here's a line from your website that really jumped off the page. Becca's music is filtered through the lens of personal anxiety. <laughs> Explain that. Well, I think it's especially relevant standing here in front of a stage and a microphone. Um, I have general anxiety disorder, and it's present in almost everything I write, even if it's not the main theme of the music. My music has a lot of anxious gestures, a lot of little tiny sounds that you're wondering are there. It kind of inspires a, a sense of the unknown, in a way. I liked it. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I liked it. I like that edginess. I really love the unpredictability. Um, don't take this the wrong way, because I really mean it in a good way, but it's a little bit itchy. Oh, good. Itchy, twitchy. I feel that way. OK. Yeah. Um, so if the creation of your music is fueled by anxiety, does the act of writing it down then relieve your anxiety? Does it get it out? Not all the way, but okay. it certainly does help, for sure. It feels like um, a little bit of osmosis, you know, leaving the body through music or something. So it helps a little bit. It's a pur yes. It is a purging process. Um, not first and foremost, but it's certainly a part of my music making. Okay. 
Now, come on over here, Ms. Amanda. So that was an incredible performance. You. You're eliciting sounds that, that were mind-boggling. How challenging was it for you to play with something that isn't a human being? Because you're not allowed any wiggle room with a recording, or are you? So how strict did you have to keep to the recording? Did you bond with this recording? <laughs> oh my god, like, it must be so easy to get lost as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely depends on the piece. I've played some electroacoustic pieces that do have some wiggle room. Uh, this one did not so much. Okay. Uh, Becca is very specific about the way she notes it, notates her rhythms, um, but it's helpful that she provides uh, a lot of information in the uh, in the score on what the electronics are doing. So it's a lot easier to follow that way. Okay. Do you find you have to practice this more than traditional stuff? I don't think so. It's just like playing chamber music. You need to actually know the other parts, right? You do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it, but in this case, if you make a mistake, because live performance, I mean, that is part of the beauty and part of the excitement. Is that sometimes people screw up and you have to catch up. So when you make a mistake with a recording, what do you do? Do you know where to jump ahead to? Do you, are you freaking out inside your head? <laughs> or you know the other person isn't going to yell at you because it can't talk back, which is kind of a good thing. So how do you negotiate error? Yeah, again, it's very similar to chamber music. You just know where your cues are and you know if you know the spots where you're most likely to mess up and you know where to jump back in. So it's kind of yeah. the same. You just jump yeah. forward and find yeah. your place again. Exactly. All right. Okay, well, <laughs> big thanks to you both. Um, it was intense and really eye-opening. I just loved it. I loved that it felt a little itchy. Um, thanks to you both. Um, enjoy the rest of your day Thank with you. your green hair. I hope you have some green <laughs> beard tomorrow, too. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. This is CBC Music's Classical Juno Showcase, and I'm Julie Nasralla. Vincent Ho is a multi-award winning composer of orchestral, chamber, and vocal and theater music. The New York Times describes his work as brilliant and compelling. Please welcome Vincent Ho to the stage. Mr. Vincent. Yes. As I listen to your pieces, which are filled with so much color and so much texture and really different and interesting ideas and so many emotional sounds, I think to myself, what is, ha what is happening up there? What is happening inside your brain? Like, how does an idea come to you? And then how do you go from getting these soundscapes to putting them down on paper? It depends on the day you ask me, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, honestly, it depends if I'm inspired or not. If I'm not inspired and I'm racking my brain, I'm just thinking, okay, I have to figure something out. What am I supposed to say? Now, when I am inspired, the best analogy I have is when you're with someone you love, your wife, your girlfriend, uh, your child, you just don't think about anything. You just feel something. You're in the moment. You're not thinking about the past. You're not thinking about the future. You're just there. And from there, you just take that energy, that emotional, I guess, moment or inspiration, and you just run with it. Uh, when I'm at the piano, when I have those moments, I just run with it. And I start either playing on the piano, and the ideas start to flow, and I start sketching ideas, or I start sketching first and see what happens, to see where the ideas take me. And little by little, I'm having a conversation with this energy in graphical form or musical form and just letting it take me to wherever it wants to go. So, so you're sitting there and you're getting this sound of the wind, let's say. Yeah. And you know, your brain just knows exactly, this is where the wind is and this is how I'm going to make this, how I'm going to create the sound. That is a kind of, is there a kind of effortlessness 
to that sometimes, part of it too? Sometimes, a lot of times it's trial and error. Yeah. I just think to myself, if, for example, like you said, if I want to capture that sound, that wind, I think to myself, okay, the wind sound, let's start with this. Does that work? No, maybe I'll shape that. And then I work on it one day, the next day I look at it again and I say to myself, oh, is that how I really want it? Let's shape it again. And little by little, it starts to get chiseled out over a few days and it, it uh, evolves on its own. So, and that's what they call the creative process. It's really amazing with the composers. I mean, you just think of traditional composers like Mozart and Beethoven, we take it for granted, but you know, these people had these sounds in their heads and they transferred them to page and then we bring them to life. So I'm out, because I can't compose my way out of a paper bag, <laughs> I really cannot. Mm -hmm. So I'm really fascinated by how it's happening inside your head and how you transfer it down. So it's... Well, uh, like, like I said, every day is different. Yeah. And I gotta tell you, facing a blank page each day, and I'm sure every composer will agree, is the hardest thing to face each day. It used to be for me, facing a blank page is like getting into a boxing ring, ready to do battle with every day's challenge. Now it feels like a dance. I oh. see a blank page and I feel like, okay, here's the challenge, let me respond to that. And the challenge responds to me and we have a little back and forth. It becomes a bit of a dance. So there's now a little bit of a healthy dialogue that I have with my little adversary, the challenge, so. That's a beautiful way to round that out. It's a little bit yeah. of a dance. Yeah. Thank you so much. No problem, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Vincent. This is CBC Music's Juno Classical Showcase, and I'm Julie Nasralla.
Now there's something you don't hear every day. 
You just heard Katana of Choice, music by Nicole Lise, with a performance by percussionist Ben Reimer. I'm Julie Nisralla, and this is CBC Music's Juno Classical Showcase. Welcome. Thanks, thanks. Great to be here. I got to also wonder what's going on in your mind now. You guys are going to keep me up all night. Um, you've been called a brilliant musical scientist and a genre-bending whiz. So you're clearly into some pretty funky stuff, like reviving the obsolete and using glitches to create precision. Okay, can you explain the reviving the obsolete? Explain this. I'll explain, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, it, it has a lot to do with my upbringing. I grew up uh, surround my, my father as an electronics uh, repairman and, and collector and uh, salesman. So I grew up, he kept everything. So, and many of these things, you know, he kept everything from the 40s or 50s and uh, all throughout the decades. And uh, much of it didn't work. This was like the height of technology, but much of it didn't work and it would glitch, it was analog, so it wouldn't quit completely, but it would glitch. So I was surrounded by this while simultaneously being surrounded by actual you know, instruments and everything, but for me, from a very young age, these glitching machines were as just as much of an instrument as a violin or a piano, and I began to write with them. And those stutterings and those stops and starts became a part of my, they, they saturated my, my brain. And so for me, it's very natural just to have them coexist together. You heard the music in the glitch, which is just incredible, an everyday thing. It's uh, very John Cage of you <laughs> in a lot of ways. Um, you've heard of Guitar Hero. Well, Ben Reimer is a percussion hero. Are you going to come on over here and join us? Come on over. Um, you guys, this is some like really, not, not next level, like way next level, slightly sinister, right? The video was kind of sinister too. I was kind of a little afraid of that guy. So I, it, but you're creating a feeling. You're putting out this big feeling and I just love that. Um, so you're looking at the catchphrase multitasking, multitasking in the rear view mirror because what you are doing up there is intensely virtuosic. Um, for anyone who's tried to pat their head and even rub their stomach, I mean, this is how are you keeping all this straight? And then you're putting on the mask and you're holding up the little gun. Ben, how are you managing this? Do you do this one at a time and then you incorporate? Um, it, it's sort of a, a buildup of, uh, from over the years, really working with Nicole and um, sort of adding some of these types of elements in some pieces in the past in, in maybe a little bit smaller form, but. Uh, things like doing the, the multiple feet while playing things in the hands. Uh, this was the first time th that we did or the, the stylophone and the chaos pad and all that stuff at the same time. So it was sort of just an, another sort of new level to add on to sort of what we'd already been working on. So it's, it wasn't like it happens overnight. It takes a lot of practice. Right. Nothing, nothing yeah. happens overnight, right? No, um, so you have a story about glockenspiel <laughs> and rush. Right, yeah, well, for, for me, and I'm, I have fairly confident that Nicole also, uh, our, our, our memory or our association with, with Rush and with the glockenspiel is, is Neil Peart from hearing from his first album he ever recorded with Rush. He incorporated the glockenspiel, tubular bells, uh, a lot of different orchestration in his drum set. That, that sound, like to me, drum set is, includes a glockenspiel, like a four-piece kit is hi-hat, snare, kick, and glock, you know. Like it's part of Glock. its world, its sound yeah. world. So you're a huge Rush fan, you have been. Mm -hmm. And are, are you on the same Rush yes. page? Massive you're a Rush Rushian fan. I think that's as what well. brought us together. Okay. <laughs> um, oh, that's what brought you together. Well, I mean, uh, yeah. yeah. We'll say that right. Yeah, as it were. Today. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so when you go to, like, when I go to warm up my voice, I have a two or three exercises that I do. So how do you warm up for the drums? What do you do to warm up before sitting down and attempting this amazing physical feat? Well, ideally you have exercises that you can do with your feet and with your hands, but when you're waiting in, a, in, you know, in your green room downstairs, yeah. I don't have an extra drum kit I'm allowed to bring along, and they're loud. You would have heard me practicing this whole time. So uh, mostly I'm, I'm, I do a little bit of footwork. I do a little, little sparring, boxing, and, uh, and I do some stuff on a practice pad. 
Okay, there you go. Everybody's got their process backstage. Now you know what he's doing backstage. When there's no drum kit, you can picture him. Well, thank you both for being here. That was intense and intensely amazing and fascinating and just extremely virtuosic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you. It was amazing. And now, Jamie Parker is here to play music by Cassandra Miller, who couldn't be here today, but here's her piece called Philip the Wanderer.
I'm Julie Nasralla, and this is CBC Music's Juno Classical Showcase. So now a performer who has been described as clearly, absolutely, undoubtedly a virtuoso by the La Presse from Montreal. And here's the really cute part. He thought he was invited to the Junos by mistake. <laughs> Blake Pouliot is here together with pianist Shin Ni Wang. Come over here, Dynamo. So, you're a pretty wow person. You debuted with an orchestra at just 11 years old. You perform all over the world for prime ministers, and this got me. You performed on the same bill as Diana Ross. I did. How was, did you meet her? Yeah. Oh my gosh, we yeah. need to have a Diana moment. What, ha what happened? Was she nice to you? She, I mean, she, was, she smells amazing. <gasps> and I, that's, I know that sounds weird, but she does. She, 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 she's, I mean, she's lovely. I mean, she's such a world class. I mean, there's a reason she is who she is, um, you know, at her age. And she's doing all these sets and all these wardrobe changes. She was amazing. I mean, the first thing she said to me when she came off of stage, I was, I was wearing this sequin jacket. And she came to me and she was like, hey, I like your jacket. And I was like, hey, I, I like you. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but she was absolutely lovely. I totally, totally loved her. And I told her afterwards, we got to go up and um, I got to have like a little meet and greet with her and I and, uh, got to meet her and take some photos. And I told her and I said, you know, I was trying to, trying to compete with you tonight to see who would have the tallest hair, but she still won, so, you know. You ain't gonna win that one, I ain't honey. gonna win that Shut one, up. no. Oh. no. Um, you and Shani are going to play Ravel's Tzigan, or Gypsy, and I cannot wait. Uh, but you also get to play a very special instrument, a 1792 Guarneri del Gesù. Just Hold up. switch those last two numbers, oh. 1729. Oh, 1729. Yeah. Yeah. That's even more bonkers. It's yeah. 1729 Guarneri del Gesù, mm -hmm. on loan from the Canada Council for the Arts. Um, I wouldn't even breathe next to this instrument. So can, can you describe what it's like to play an instrument of that caliber? Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, this is our tool. This is like, this is what I get to use and work with every day. I mean, this is my voice, you know, I, if I could, I would be a singer, but I'm, I'm not nominated for singing for a very good reason. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I really, I, I wanted to channel something that I could sing with and, and have a voice. And for me, um, I just clung to the violin, and it was something that I totally was captivated by. And so, in particular, uh, this violin was, I got the privilege of choosing. And I say that, you know, you connect with an instrument, um, like, there, there really is a tangible connection. And um, I can't describe it necessarily in words, um, but you, if this is my palette and my canvas and my paints, it's everything that I can do with it. And it's how I channel my emotion and my artistry. And so, for me personally, I mean, it's just a dream to be able to actually have something that can channel everything that I want to describe and that I want to say in my music. So, I mean, I, I was lucky enough to, to get this um, three years ago and then I, they loaned it to me for another three years. So I get to continue using it and I'm just delighted and I can't wait to share it with you. <laughs> okay, let's get to the sharing part. Cool, sounds good. Here they are. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, violinist Blake Pouliot and pianist Shin Ni Wang with a performance of Tzigan or Gypsy by Maurice Ravel.
I'm Julie Nasralla, and you're listening to CBC Music's Juno Classical Showcase. From one outstanding performance to the next, here is Marc-André Amelin. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm sorry that I can't be there in London, Ontario with you. Um, I'll be on the final leg of a European tour, and uh, I'll be on my way to Florence. So uh, here is a little Schubert for you. I'm here with you in spirit. This is the, uh, from the second set of impromptus, the one, the beautiful one in A flat.
What's your moment of zen? Everybody needs a little bit of that energy every day. A little bit of that Schubert. Tender and poised, and the poignancy in his playing and in his face. You just heard Marc-André Amelin with Schubert's impromptu in A-flat major, opus 142, number two. If your soul needs to see this performance again, you can watch it by going to cbcmusic.ca slash junos, where you can watch CBC Music's Juno Classical Showcase on demand. I'm coming over to you, Trish. Dear Trish, <laughs> you effortlessly negotiate a variety of genres, classical, cabaret, jazz, to the music of Leonard Cohen. What can you tell us about what you're going to sing today? Okay, okay so this is, in fact, it's a sacred oratorio called Corona Divine Misericordiae by David Braid. Uh, however, David Braid he won the Juno last year in the jazz category. So that shows us that this is a, a really polystylistic piece of music, even though it is firmly rooted in classical music. There are definitely in influences of other cultures and of jazz harmonies and voicings and so forth. Excellent, so we're in for a treat. Yeah, yeah, because when you mix it up, it's amazing. Okay, but a little bird also told me that there was a bit of drama with the first attempt to record this piece, and maybe you can just regale us with a bit of that crazy story. Yes, yes, so, so David called, he emailed me, I was in Australia at the time, and he brought me in from Australia, he brought the conductor in from China, uh, the producer in from the UK, Canada, and so we're all there in Prague, ready to record, and on the day of the recording, there is a buzz in the studio. It's sort of like the CBC, but in, in Prague. It's the big TV studio there. There is a buzz that will not go away, and it's throughout the entire building. And basically, the engineer said, so we can record this, and there's going to be a buzz in it that you won't be able to get rid of, or we can just you know, trash this entire session. So he made that call. We had to all leave, go back to our respective countries. We, we had a few drinks after, you know, the failed recording session. <laughs> and then we all came back two months later to do the same thing again. It worked, fortunately, that time. Then we came back to Canada and, and did a whole bunch more recording in a basement studio. So I think there was a total of five sessions. It was a big ordeal, yeah. It's a glamorous life, folks. <laughs> yeah. Here now is Patricia O'Callaghan with the Griffin Trio, with excerpts from David Braid's Corona Divine Misericordia.
You just heard Patricia O'Callaghan with the Griffin Trio with excerpts from David Braid's Corona Divine Misericordia. And guess what? That's it. That's all. I know, honey. That's it. That's all. A huge thank you to all the performers. And thank you, 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 for being here for CBC Music's Juno Classical Showcase. Remember to visit cbcmusic.ca slash Junos for all your Juno needs, including watching Classical Showcase On Demand. I'm Julie Nazrella. Have a fantastic day.